Hello, I'm Tony Perkins, President of the Family Research Council, and I want to welcome you to Privacy and Freedom, Good for Business. Chances are, at some point, you've used a public bathroom or a gym locker room or shower. If so, then it should be pretty obvious why, as a society, we have always separated these facilities by sex. It's basic common sense that safety and privacy, especially of women and children, should be protected. I say should be obvious because we live in a time when politicians, radical activists, and even all-male professional sports leagues have begun calling on states to open up their showers, locker rooms, and bathrooms to anyone on the basis of a professed gender identity. The cultural elites use so-called non-discrimination laws to silence and bully those who disagree, just as they did on the marriage issue. Ten years ago, you would not have thought such a public debate over men using women's showers and vice versa was even possible. So how in the world did we get to this point? When did it become okay for corporate interest and liberal bureaucrats to gang up on people, seeking to penalize, bully, and silence parents, taxpayers, and business owners who refuse to go along? And more importantly, what can you do about it? Now, those are great questions, and the very reason we're bringing you this special program, Privacy and Freedom, Good for Business. In the next 45 minutes, we'll have a number of political, policy, and economic experts help us answer these pressing questions, and we'll have some, some uh, very specific action steps on how you can protect your children from this pernicious agenda. Now, the best place to start is at the beginning. How did all of this begin? Until two years ago, when the Supreme Court redefined marriage in all 50 states, even radical LGBT lobbyists avoided this issue of genderless and gender-confused bathrooms. Back then, efforts to radically redefine the sexes were largely confined to just a handful of states and a dozen local cities. Only a few of those actually made headlines, like San Antonio's ordinance, which first, at first penalized free speech, and then of course there was Houston, Texas, where former Mayor Anise Parker subpoenaed sermons in order to silence the church. Which brings up another aspect of these laws, the inherent and dangerous conflict with religious freedom. So to begin, our first guest is Kathy Roos. She is a senior fellow here for legal studies at FRC. Kathy, welcome to the program. Great to be with you, Tony. Let's start, as we said, at the beginning and kind of tee this up. How did all of this begin? I mean, I think we, we go back in the first instance, I think was in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's right. And the thing that almost no one realizes in the mainstream media, at least, is that the transgender lobby started this fight in February of 2016. They convinced the um, local um, city council to pass an ordinance saying that all public showers, bathrooms, locker rooms had to be open up to people of both sexes. So wait a minute, let me be clear on this. This, yeah. this was not conservatives that were going That's on right. the advance. They That's were, right. This was liberal LGBT activists working with a mayor in Charlotte exactly. to change existing policy. And interestingly, all of the big social policy law cases tended to start with sort of like a fake problem. Mm -hmm. This wasn't you know, anything real. This was an agenda being moved through a city council for the very purpose of advancing this agenda. It wasn't really a real problem. I mean, everybody agrees on that. But so, of course, the General Assembly had to respond. And they responded by saying, look, we're going to say that in government buildings, you um, use the p a private facility that corresponds to your biological right. sex. So theirs was a responsive measure. They didn't start the fight. Yeah, in fact, what uh, it's called HB2, it's mm -hmm. the private safe, uh, public safety law there in North Carolina, which happened about a month after Charlotte took those steps. It doesn't prohibit a private business from right. doing anything. It just right. says governments can't force businesses or other private entities to do such things as Charlotte wanted. That's right. And, of course, um, then the Obama administration got involved and, and sued North Carolina, and there was a counter um, action by a, a large number of states saying right. this is n that, that you can't force us to do this. And interestingly, as that suit proceeded, we got, um, in August of last year, a na nationwide um, injunction on the Obama administration's um, edict uh, when it comes um, to... Um, this matter and um, that has um, stood. Right. So 
Yeah. So, in fact, it's not just a couple of states. No. So as we, we saw in North Carolina, they were joined by 11 other states mm -hmm. that uh, did a countersuit against the um, the Obama administration. And then, of course, you had both the education and justice weigh in with these letters of uh, direction to schools exactly. across the country. And at that point, nearly two dozen uh, states jumped into this fighting back. And as you made reference to, that's been enjoined in uh, the Trump administration. Um, has removed the federal government's um, opposition to that stay. Now, right. it's still in the court, uh, right. but they're no longer fighting the stay that was uh, put in. Right, and the court. injunction is now currently in place nationwide against what the Obama okay. administration was trying to do, which was similar to what these activists in North Carolina were doing. Well, let's talk more broadly. I mean, yeah. this kind of gives us how we got here, and it, right. it clearly was being driven by the left, yep. the, the Obama administration pushing this agenda. Absolutely. How does this impact education at the local level? Well, um, interestingly, the, um, this all came about um, at all these different levels right when Obergefell happened, which is when the Supreme Court right. forced gay, ma gay marriage on the nation. You know, up until that point, transgenderism wasn't an issue. I mean, my husband is finishing a book on fake science, and he's got a great little bit um, of research that showed that in 1995, the New York Times mentioned transgender twice. You know, in 2005, there were 50 mentions. By 2015, there were 700 mentions. And then after Obergefell, 2016, there were over 1,000 stories on transgenderism in, in, in the New York Times, even though the population of transgendered people, people who claim that, is less than one hundredth of one percent. It's a tiny little bit of the population, and yet it's an explosion in this public conversation. Well, why? Well, I mean, many people could have theories, but it almost seems as if the gay rights movement, after they had won the gold star of gay marriage nationwide, they had to find other issues, other reasons to call people on the but, other but, side bigots. But wait a minute, Kathy. I, I thought we were told that the redefinition of marriage would have no impact right. upon people. Well, and you're, what you're saying is what we're seeing policies in schools across America being changed as a result. At exactly that time, absolutely. And in, and um, Policies not only in terms of showers and bathrooms and locker rooms, which are horrible, but also um, uh, sex ed classes now teaching um, transgenderism as a healthy alternative lifestyle for children. And just the, and the psychological impact, and we're seeing this all across the country, of teaching a child that he or she may be born in the wrong body. I mean, the psychological damage, not even getting to the point of privacy violations, but just the psychological damage that can happen to children. If these authority figures in schools are telling them what they see with their own eyes may be a lie or false or not real. I mean, it's terrible. Uh, Kathy, one final question for you. I mean, how significant is the issue of transgenderism that it needs this global one-size-fits-all policy from Washington, D.C. Right. on every school district in America. Well, my friend Stella Morabito, who's a former uh, Soviet propaganda analyst at the CIA, says this has all the ha hallmarks of propaganda. I mean, it is an effort to divorce people from reality, to prevent them from using a common language. We can't even use pronouns now that reflect the reality right. of a person's. So all of this to in the effort to gain power. This is an, this is an effort by elites and government government bureaucrats frankly to gain more and more power over their subjects who are us. I mean it's it's a power grab, it's mind hacking. Those are also the words of Stella, which is exactly what it is. Mind hacking of kids and and all of us really to suggest that we are uh, that we can, you can change your sex. Um, so it is an it's an attempt to grab power. What can I say? That's my theory anyway. Yeah, yeah. And bizarre. Kathy Roos, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. Well, folks, uh, next we're going to talk to the Lieutenant Governor of the state of North Carolina. Uh, but first, let's take a look at the corporate hypocrisy on this issue. Watch this. Heard the news? Big business is all up in arms about new laws passed in North Carolina and Mississippi. Leaders of major corporations have denounced the new protections for women, children, churches, and yes, businesses too. They're upset because in North Carolina, the government cannot punish businesses for having bathrooms designated for men only and women only. And in Mississippi, the new law stops the government from discriminating against people who believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. But many of these same corporations are actively seeking to do business in Cuba, are doing business in countries where women are treated as property 
property and not even allowed to drive, in countries where homosexual behavior is illegal, even in countries where homosexuality is punishable by death. What hypocrisy. As big business scolds conservative lawmakers, just remember, when it comes to moral authority, these corporations don't have any ground to stand on. Joining us now by Skype is the recently re-elected Lieutenant Governor of the state of North Carolina, Dan Forrest, who has been out front on this issue, protecting the citizens of North Carolina ever since Charlotte took these first steps. Uh, Governor, welcome uh, to the program today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Tony, for having me on once again. Uh, let's start uh, first off for our listeners that may not be completely familiar with, uh, with HB2, the reason for HB2 and what exactly it does. Well, uh, you have to go back a ways to uh, Charlotte uh, passing an ordinance in, in the city uh, over a year ago now that uh, basically said that uh, all bathrooms had to be opened up to all people at all time, uh, trying to obviously appease the transgender community in the city. Uh, it's, uh, I think, fair to say that there really wasn't a problem to begin with, but they were trying to create a solution for a problem that didn't exist. So they created this uh, policy that not only said you have to uh, open up your bathrooms and allow anybody into any bathroom at any time, even for private businesses, uh, but they also then tried to tag on protected class status for the LGBT community, something that the majority of American states, as well as the federal government, uh, doesn't recognize and the Supreme Court has said is not necessary. Uh, so uh, the state of North Carolina had to come back and protect its constitution. The city of Charlotte unlawfully did what they did. We are a Dillon rule state, which means we give those authorities to the city. Uh, to all of our cities. We did not give that authority away, and so they didn't have the proper right to do that. In fact, they didn't even come to the state to uh, mention the problem. So HB2, basically, in a nutshell, it just said, no, uh, City of Charlotte, you can't do that. You can't open up your bathrooms. You can't tell private businesses what to do. HB2, in response, said private businesses, you get to choose uh, what you want to do with your bathrooms. Hence, uh, a large part of the hypocrisy in this from the, from the left and from some of these corporations, because those businesses can do what they want with their bathrooms. And it also said you had to provide reasonable accommodation for people that had transgender issues. Uh, and so a reasonable accommodation is a big part of this. And we said, no, you can't provide uh, special protected class status as well. Governor, if excuse me, but I think that sounds like a pretty reasonable response. You're not forcing businesses to do anything. You're saying you can do whatever you want. We won't have this on government property because we have a responsibility there. But, but I, I don't I don't get the left's response, especially corporate America. Well, corporate America, generally speaking, depends on who you're talking about. If you're talking those that are beholden to the human rights campaign and the document they signed with the human rights campaign saying they stood against discrimination. So when the human rights campaign comes back to them and says somebody like North Carolina is discriminating, they don't ask any questions. They're not asking, well, what's discriminatory about this bill? Uh, they're just getting the pressure from, from organizations like that saying we're going to boycott you. We're going to come against you if you don't uh, do our bidding. So it's a bit of an extortion that goes on between these organizations like the NBA, like the NCAA and the state of North Carolina saying, unless you adopt policy we agree with, we are going to punish your state. We're going to come against you. We're going to boycott you. We're going to move business out of your state. We're going to take the NBA All-Star game. The interesting hypocrisy about that is when they signed the agreement with the city of Charlotte for the NBA All-Star game, when the NCAA signed all these agreements for these championship games, it's the exact same law that we have now in North Carolina. All we did was return the status quo and tell Charlotte that they couldn't uh, do what they were trying to do. Right. But also a double hypocrisy is the NBA could have done whatever they wanted to with their bathrooms, but they've chosen not to do that anyway. Uh, PayPal, who decided they weren't going to expand in North Carolina, could open up all the their bathrooms if they chose to. They haven't done that even corporately, uh, but they're demanding that North Carolina do things that they're not willing to do as a corporation. And you know, Tony, you could add to that uh, the fact that they still do business in places like Saudi Arabia and Yemen, where the LBGT community is not only persecuted, they can be executed for their beliefs. So it's not fully an ideological battle, but it's one that we're facing anyway. Lieutenant Dan Forrest, Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest, let me ask you this question from a standpoint of the um, economics of this. We've uh, been hearing all of these stories uh, from the left that, uh, you know, these boycotts of uh, North Carolina, the NBA, uh, the NCAA, and all of these others, that it's, it's uh, dealt a death blow to uh, North Carolina's uh, economy. Now, obviously, you, you don't want those things to happen, but when I actually look at the economic reports, 
North Carolina keeps climbing the ladder in terms of its economic status. We're doing extremely well uh, on the economy side here. We've done all the right things as Republicans to get our economy back in order again. Forbes just named us the number two place uh, in the country, number two state to do business in the country. We're at the top number one in site, uh, CEO uh, magazine, site selection magazine. We're at the top of the list. You go on down the list, but we've created hundreds of thousands of new jobs uh, over the past couple of years where businesses are still moving here. People are still moving here in record numbers. Uh, the total impact, if you wanted to take it, uh, just let's say the latest numbers that the governor just threw out yesterday related to the NCAA and all these sporting events, they said, uh, well, that could cost the state of North Carolina $250 million. Uh, that is less than one quarter of 1% of our annual GDP in our state. Uh, is, it, is it significant? Well, it's, it is what it is, right? Uh, but as I've said all along, we don't put a price tag on the safety and security and privacy of our women and children in North Carolina, especially for a sporting event. Uh, so I, I think that this extortion that's going on from the NCAA and places like that, when they're moving sporting events out of North Carolina into states that have the exact same law that North Carolina does, uh, based on uh, a law that we won't establish, that the federal government doesn't have, and the Supreme Court won't uphold either, uh, that's uh, the height of hypocrisy. Uh, one final question for you, Governor Forrest. What would you say to other policymakers around the country that are now being faced with this same policy uh, being pushed on them through the Department of Education uh, into their schools? Well, I just say don't be don't be bullied. You know, I mean that's the one thing you have to stand strong. I, I've always said you'll never you'll never do wrong by doing the right thing. There may be tough consequences for doing the right thing in the short term, but long term, I think the consequences will be good. And when people say people aren't going to move to North Carolina or whatever your state happens to be, that's not true at all. There are more people that say I'm coming to North Carolina because you're standing strong to protect women and children in your state than there are people saying I'm not going to come. Uh, do does any state want a black eye for uh, the kind of attack that comes against them from the left on this. No, you don't want it. But they're, when these fights are brought to you, when they're delivered to you, we didn't bring it on ourselves, but when they're delivered, you need to stand up and fight for what's right. Governor Danforth, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, as always, great to talk with you. Thanks, Tony. Have a great day. And folks, I just want to remind you, we've got a number of resources available for you on this topic. And, and one I, I want to make available for you. It's at the website, frc.org slash privacy. And it's a, a measure, it's a paper, a one pager on HB2, because there's a lot of false information out there in the media. And this uh, one page tells you what it does and does not do. Again, you can find that at frc.org slash privacy. Well, now it's, uh, it's a privilege to have uh, joining with me the governor of the great state of uh, Texas, who is uh, literally fighting this battle in the Lone Star State. Uh, governor, Dan Patrick, thanks so much for joining Lieutenant us. Lieutenant Governor, I, I want to be oh, sure, well. I want to be sure Greg Abbott, he doesn't think uh, I got a promotion while, while he was out of town. Well, sometimes there's little, there's little lieutenants <laughs> yeah, in front yeah, of there, you know, right. but uh, gov Governor, thanks for joining us. Great to, great to be here. You know, Dan is one of my heroes, by the way. Well, I, I know you've been tracking what's yes. been happening in North Carolina, but uh, you have been thrown into this because yes. of what the Department of Education did in pushing this on to schools in the state of, uh, of Texas. So now you, as the presiding officer over the Senate yep. uh, and one of the key policymakers in the state of Texas, you're taking action to protect uh, women and children. We're doing what North Carolina did. We're fighting back. Our bill is a little bit different than their bill, but our objective is the same, and that's to provide common sense, common decency, privacy, and public safety to women. Uh, and our bill also protects men as well. I mean, it can, it can happen in either area, but we're really focused on the women as we see them as being vulnerable, uh, not on the transgender issue as much as all of the sexual predators right, right. who will exploit these rules to go into the ladies' room. You know, some people, Tony, uh, don't understand this issue. They think, well, only men wearing a dress could go into the ladies' room. No, if these ordinances are allowed to stand, if these school district policies are allowed to stand, a man or a young man um, dressed as we are or in any kind of clothes and jeans and a khaki shirt could go into the ladies' room and there's nothing that could be done about it. In Houston, about two years ago, uh, we had a, uh, a mayor who was uh, a lesbian and in her last few months uh, she decided to push this uh, on the people and the people signed petitions to get it on the ballot. And in a city that's 75% Democrat, the only place in America of any size that's actually voted on it, right. uh, the black church, the brown church, the white church, 
Republicans and Democrats came together. Again, a 75% Democrat city, and we defeated that 61% to 39%. And here's the real data point on economics. Houston had the Super Bowl. I don't know of one business that hasn't come to Houston since the voters stood up and said, we don't want men in ladies' rooms, and we don't want boys and girls showering together in school. Yeah, can 65% of the public in uh, Houston be bigoted? Yeah, no, of course not. Yeah. Um, of course not. And, and when you poll this issue, not only is it 80% uh, of Republicans who don't want these policies, it's, it's over 50% of Democrats, but very high in the minority community, 70% of African Americans and Hispanics. Look, this is, as you open the show, we shouldn't even be having to discuss this. Right. Um, so what happened after we defeated Houston, we thought we were done. And then we had the Fort Worth uh, Independent School District, a school district of 86,000, uh, unilaterally, no parental input, no school board vote, come forth and say, from now on, boys can use the, the girls' room, they can shower, they can use the locker rooms. And I stepped in as the lieutenant governor, and eventually the parents uh, came uh, alive to the issue and we got Fort Worth to withdraw that district, that edict. And what was so egregious in that edict, they said they would punish any teacher or any school personnel who told a parent that little Johnny wanted to be known as Mary in school. Well, that violated our education code in Texas. Right. Every parent deserves to know what's going on in the school with their child. And then so we thought that was over. And then we have another school district now, Dripping Springs in Texas. Um, it's the same type of policy. So we're and, gonna pass but, a state law to stop this. But they're using the guidance from the Department of Education as the cover for this. Well, they're just using their, their own illogical, irrational, yeah a leftist attitude on it, quite frankly. They're not even worried about that. We sent a letter out to every school district to stand down as we fought this battle. Our Attorney Gen General, Ken Paxton, helped lead the fight to get this stay. But now our bill, uh, in this regard, we are similar to Carolina. Uh, we say to businesses, you make up your mind what you want to do. If you want to be as dumb as Target, be as dumb as Target. By the way, I, want to mention, I was going to mention that yes. with Lieutenant uh, Governor Dan Forrest. Target, uh, who is the only corporation that I'm aware of that has embraced yeah. this policy, and there's probably a reason, uh, their stock since uh, embracing this has right. dropped by about $20 per share from $85, $85 down to... Even in this hot market, to, yeah, it's That's down. right. Everything else is up. up. They're down. And, um, you know, if you, if you want to uh, see a real version of CSI, uh, just go into one of their changing rooms because, I mean, it's been the site of uh, crime scenes uh, we've had a number of cases of uh, voyeurism and other uh, acts, illegal acts taking place. As you pointed out, th th we're not talking about necessarily transgender people committing crime. No. It is those taking advantage taking of advantage. these laws. Yeah, in almost every case, we've seen some video of people, men running from the store when the, you know a woman caught them because they had a camera right. or uh, whatever they were doing in there. And I go back to this issue that you and Dan talked about and you put up on the screen of these companies. I mean, American Airlines, they're one of the leaders to fight against our bill. Uh, I want to know if Doug Parker, the CEO of American Airlines, believes that boys and girls should shower together in 10th grade. Roger Goodell, Greg Abbott, my friend, my partner, our governor in Texas, he just took on the NFL because they sent us a letter, well, we might not let you have another Super right. Bowl. Well, by, then, by the way, I've, yes. I've got his quote. I'm going to put his quote, quote yeah. up there on the screen. The, the governor responded to the NFL uh, saying the NFL's decision makers also benched Tom Brady last season. It ended with NFL handing the Super Bowl trophy to Brady. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, he's not, uh, he's not sitting on the sidelines. He's actually challenging the NFL and their uh, misguided uh, weighing in on this issue. Yeah, he told them yesterday uh, on a radio, national radio show, they need to, you know, get out of politics. I mean, they, they didn't stand up when, when uh, against players who wouldn't respect the flag. They were slow to come to action on domestic violence. And now they want to tell us, look, if Roger Goodell wants, he believes in this policy and that all of us should allow our children to shower together in 10th and 11th grade, which will be, create so much chaos in schools, uh, obviously, besides it, it, it not being what parents want, well then let Roger Goodell, why, why, don't, why doesn't the NFL make an announcement today that next season in all their stadiums across the country, they're going to allow men into the ladies' room you know, at halftime or, you know, any time on the concourse. They're not going to do it. In fact, the businesses uh, that are opposing us on this, again, would never initiate this policy. Right. Right. Never initiate this policy. And, and there's a reason. The public is not for this. You've made, right. uh, you made reference to some of the polls. I, I want to show one poll that uh, we conducted with um, WPA Opinion Research. And, and here's the question. Do you approve or disapprove of government forcing schools, businesses, and nonprofit organizations to open the showers, changing facilities, locker rooms, and bathrooms 
designated for women and girls to buy biological males and vice versa. Pretty straightforward, no spin on it, very factual. 66% of the total population approves, only 28% uh, approves of that. 66 disapprove, 28 And, and that correlates with two polls that, that we've been involved with, with the University of Texas poll that they did in the fall. Uh, this, is, this is not a controversial issue. In fact, that 28%, when you dig down deep in the polls, what you find out, the only people who are in favor of this tend to be Anglo elite liberals. And a lot of them control the print media, unfortunately. And they don't use public restrooms. Uh, and they don't use public restrooms. They have their own private bathrooms. Well, let's, uh, Governor, you're going to stick with me yes, here sir. for a few minutes. We, we're going to bring in a few other experts on this issue. You've missed, mentioned business. We talked yes. about this with uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest about the economic impact. And so uh, we want to bring in a veteran government reporter with over a decade of uh, news experience who is now a senior analyst, um, Mitch Kokai, he has uh, been closely following the threats uh, of businesses leaving North Carolina. Mitch, uh, welcome uh, to the program. Well, thank you for having me. It's a very important topic, and I'm glad you uh, gave us a chance to talk about it. Well, um, you know, we were talking about this just a few moments ago with um, uh, the lieutenant governor there in North Carolina about the uh, reported economic hit that business uh, is taking there in uh, the Tar Heel State. Is it true? Well, it's true that North Carolina has suffered some economic losses linked to HB2, but it's important to put all of this in the proper context because the way that it's been reported here in North Carolina, and I suspect in other parts of the country where folks are trying to make a case against House Bill 2 style legislation, is that it's caused economic devastation, and that just is not the case. What we have in North Carolina is an economy with a gross domestic product on the state level of about $510 billion. And at this point, uh, the, the widest range of estimates of the potential economic loss from House Bill 2 related uh, closings or businesses that have decided they're not going to come here or athletic events that have gone to other places is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So you're talking about a fraction of a percentage point of the gross domestic product of the state. And that's if you take these estimates at face value. Many of them are uh, taking a look at the potential multiplier effects from one particular game not being played in one particular community and saying that that's going to be a cost of tens of millions or maybe even a hundred million dollars. If you look at the probably the, the the strangest estimate of the potential impact of House Bill 2 on the North Carolina economy, it was a study done last year by uh, some professors at UCLA who estimated that the potential impact uh, on an annual basis of House Bill 2 in North Carolina could be as much as $5 billion. But you have to look at what they were counting. They were counting on the loss of federal funds because of the Obama administration's approach to these issues. Well, of course, now that's all changed with the new administration in Washington, D.C. They were also talking about uh, potentially increased costs of school bullying, and potential increased health costs because members of the LGBT community would have greater cases of depression. So basically, they threw everything not only but the kitchen sink, but also the kitchen sink into these calculations and came up with this idea that there could be a $5 billion economic impact in North Carolina. And while that is a big number, once again, you go back to the $510 billion economy, even if you got the absolute worst case scenario that no one uh, with any credibility would ever take at face value, even if you took that absolute worst case scenario, that would be a little bit less than 1% of the state's GDP. If you look at more realistic assessments, we're talking about an impact in North Carolina, but not anywhere near the economic devastation that's talked about. I should also point out that none of these studies takes a look at any potential positives. Now, I don't, I'm not going to make the case that there's a huge positive uh, economic impact, but none of these studies takes a, a look at that at all, at businesses that's, that might have decided that hey, if North Carolina is going in this direction, we don't want to go there. Or if North Carolina is going to go in this direction, I'm not going to be able to continue operating here in, in this state. And so I'm going to move elsewhere. You would have to factor in 
that type of information can I, can before I, you could have any credibility. The question, Dan Patrick here, Lieutenant Governor of Texas. Sir. Um, North Carolina is number one in the CEO magazine of destinations to move a business. And I know from our experiences in Texas, when we're recruiting a company, one of the biggest voices to make the final decision is the CEO's wife, unless it's, and if it's a woman, it could be a, a female CEO. But um, every woman I've talked to, I have yet to find anyone except a handful of people would say, I don't want my family to move, I don't want my husband to move the company, or I don't want to move my company if I'm the female CEO to a state where men can go in the ladies' room with me. And so that's, it, there's no accident that the CEOs have picked North Carolina number one, and we're always high up on the list as well. And if you look at the states across the country, all the states that have policies protecting privacy and public safety and bathrooms are thriving, and those in the opposite direction, their economies are suffering. That's the real data. And then again, the Houston, there's been no economic downturn at all that we can find. Not a business, not a dollar. We can't find anything lost when the voters push back. Yeah, and you know, the, the, the thing that you brought up that's a very important point is to make sure that the issue is framed in the proper way. And those who are supporters of House Bill 2 and have been trying to protect it and preserve it have said, hey, this is an issue about privacy and making sure that men aren't going to be hanging out in the women's locker rooms and bathrooms and changing facilities. While on the other side, House Bill 2 has been consistently portrayed as the, the most egregious anti-LGBT law ever passed in the history of the planet. Uh, so if people are talking about it in those different terms, you're, of course you're going to get some negative publicity if the law is only seen as being this hate bill that's anti-LGBT and not seen as it is just as you described as a bill that is designed to protect the safety and security of women and children in in locker rooms, in bathrooms, in changing facilities, which is the main reason that people in the legislature in North Carolina wanted to put this law in place in the first place. Mitch, before we let you go, one quick question. I'm sure you saw the uh, Texas Association of uh, Business Study claiming that uh, Texas could lose $8.5 billion if they adopt the policy that uh, Lieutenant Governor here is proposing. What do you say to that? My guess is it's very similar to that UCLA study on North Carolina where uh, you threw in everything, they not only uh, excluding the kitchen sink, but the kitchen sink too, and tried to count all kinds of things in there that no one with any credibility would accept. And, and since then, Tony, PolitiFact, which looks at a lot of data, um, they've discredited that report because some of that report was based on someone in Indiana said when they were discussing the bill, that we right. could lose a billion and a half. So they threw that up. I mean, totally discredited the report. Politifax is not a conservative And they're not a entity. conservative, no. And no. they said mostly false. Mostly so. false. Mitch, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate your insight uh, on this issue. Thank you. Well, folks, at our website, we have a number of resources that will be helpful to you as uh, you, you combat this issue and discuss transgender issues within your own community. One I want to draw your attention to is A Parent's Guide to the Transgender Movement in Education. Now in this new booklet, which is quickly becoming one of our most popular publications, you will find information about the history of the transgender movement, how to uh, talk to your child's teacher, how to be an activist, and how to get your church involved. Now you can uh, order some of these for your church, for your pastor, or uh, any parent that you know. It's also available online, downloadable in a PDF format. Um, just simply go to the website, once again, frc.org slash frc. Now next, if you are a state legislator or a member of Congress and you do not believe the bathroom issue is a concern and that is not happening across our country, well, please take the time and read the bathroom incidents report. In it, you'll find a listing of real cases of men who violated the privacy of women in bathrooms, public bathrooms, locker rooms, and other private spaces. To get these and other helpful resources, again, go to frc.org slash privacy. Our next guest is uh, Kaylee Triller Haver. She worked at the YMCA for 17 years uh, as their communications director uh, before you kind of ran into some problems because you wouldn't go along with the wise bathroom policy. That's right. Yes, uh, that happened ab about two years ago. Uh, and so at this point, nobody was talking about bathrooms anywhere. Uh, and when I was researching it, all I could find was what would have happened in Houston, actually. Um, and so this was new, it was bewildering. Um, but as somebody who was originally hired at age 15 as a locker room monitor at the Y, um, 
I was dumbfounded by what was being proposed. Well, let's talk about this policy and why you refused to go along with it. So many different reasons why it was offensive to me. Uh, first of all, I'm a Christian, and so as a Christian organization at the Y, uh, it was offensive to me that we would compromise truth in this way. Uh, but if I'm honest with you, I think the primary reason this just gutted me um, was because I am the survivor of childhood sexual abuse, uh, much of which happened in showers. And so um, as a YMCA employee, I was hypervigilant as a, an individual, sure. um, and I would regularly conduct sex offender screenings to make sure that people weren't accessing our locker rooms. So people talk about this as a bathroom issue, and that isn't a problem. Um, but I only ever experienced it in the context of b b locker room showers. Um, and as I would run these, these screenings, every single time I would run one, uh, I would find people in our database who were convicted sex offenders who had gotten through somehow. Um, I've, I've sat there, I've watched the video surveillance footage trying to catch them after it's been too late. Um, and so to me, there was a real, real risk in opening up all of our locker rooms and our showers on the basis of gender identity because it just blurs a very important safeguard um, and allows anybody to come in. And, and as we talk about this, uh, a lot of people talk about this as a transgender issue. Well, I don't know of a single law that's being proposed anywhere that even says the word transgender. What it says is gender identity, and that is synonymous right. with anything goes. So every time you read the words gender identity, you need to realize what you're reading is that anything goes. Um, and there's no, there's no criteria. And the same people that you were screening out are the same sex offenders, the sex predators. I'm not talking about the transgender no, right. community, Nobody the is. sexual predators who troll the internet. That's right. And they've taken over the internet. And they will troll the bathrooms. We've already seen them do it. Right. Um, uh, and we already know of cases in, in Texas where it's happened. That's right. Uh, so what was the outcome? Uh, so what did you do? What action did you take and what was the outcome? Sure. I fought as hard internally as I could for as long as I could before I realized that Holy smoke, this is actually part of a national movement. This is going to be a lot bigger than I thought. Um, and the Y actually decided to impose this policy without telling our members. So as a communications wow. professional, there was this moment in time where I decided to make a, a choice based on conscience, and I decided to start talking about it and telling people. Um, I ultimately got fired. Um, and much like had happened to me as a child going through abuse, um, they told me that I needed to be quiet. and that if I didn't compromise my boundaries or my conscience, I was somehow being unloving. Um, and, and to me, who had worked for so long and so hard to find a voice and to find my boundaries, um, that's abusive. And I think that we need to start talking about that in those terms. That's abusive. You don't get to do that to women. Kayla, um, did you find any allies in this as you were going through this? Uh, I did. And so what actually ended up happening is I poured my heart out on paper um, wrote a blog uh, about my experience as a rape survivor. Um, it went, it got published by the Federalist and it did very well. And every day for I think probably six months I started to hear um, from women across the country, on the left, on the right, everywhere, with similar stories saying please keep fighting. Yeah, I've, we've had contact with several women who have been sexually abused as a child, contact us and said it's a nightmare for them to walk in, to think they could walk into a bathroom a and see a man there. And we just have not uh, told this story the way it needs to be told, I think enough times to enough people in business. And, and even in business, I, I was giving a speech before the uh, uh, business group in Houston yesterday, and a lady said, well, I'm going to lose this business, you know, this is going to hurt my business. And I said, well, how about standing up for Texas values? How about standing up for you know, what we believe in. I mean, it's some, what are we going to put a price on right. next? What's next? What else does business tell us we can't do in our states? And what does the NCAA tell us in the NFL? As Greg Abbott said, the NFL is not a political arm of the United States government or the state of Texas. They need to stay out of the politics of these issues. Um, I think we're going to win. North Carolina is one. I think we're going to get our bill out of the Senate, but we're going to have a fight uh, in the Texas House, and other states are going to have a fight, but we have to win on this issue. We have to win. And we're going to talk about some of those specific action steps, but Kaylee, I want to ask you one, one, one final question, because you've been leading kind of an effort in Washington mm -hmm. State uh, to repeal their bathroom policy. Right. How can churches and pastors help in this process? I love that question, <laughs> um, and I would love to know what the answer is. I will tell you, um, just to speak frankly, I was alarmed at how difficult it was to mobilize the churches in our state. 
we had one volunteer call over 150 churches to ask for their support. Not money, we just wanted them to talk to their congregations. And out of those, 157 said yes. And I have a whole spreadsheet at home um, with the list of all these churches and the reasons they gave for declining. And there were two top ones. One was, we don't do politics. And the other was that we don't want to be perceived as unloving to the broken, marginalized people. And um, I understand that. I empathize with that. I love people. I want to be open. But at a certain point, love looks like telling the truth. And there are a lot of marginalized women already in your, your pews watching to see you not protect them. Um, so I would say whatever you can do to help get our churches going and give them that little extra boost, um, it is is ultimately loving to participate. And I, I think people don't realize how widespread sexual abuse is in our culture and in our country and our society and how many women and children in those pews have been the victims of sexual abuse. It, it's true. It's, it's alarming. Um, and I think one of the things that's so difficult about this issue is that these are people who I think something like 60% of them will never speak up anyway. And so now when they finally are trying to, in their own defense, they're being called bigots. Um, and that's so it's hard. I said yeah. one final question, but Sorry. I'm a recovering politician, so I'm going to ask <laughs> another okay. question. Okay. Sure. What would you say to women like yourself that are out there that who have a story to tell that may have never told that story, but by being public about it could make the difference in their community? I know it's hard. Uh, but I think I personally got to the point where I started to be more afraid of what would happen if I didn't speak up than what would happen if I did. And I think once you've told your story for the first time, you don't go back. There's something liberating about that. There's something freeing because now it's not in the driver's seat anymore. So if you have a story, I would strongly encourage you to find a support system and start sharing it. Have a new hero. Yes. Yeah. Kaylee, thank You're you. You're a hero. Thank oh, you. my thank goodness. No, thank no, you. Yes, you are. I appreciate you, sure. you joining us thank and you. sharing your story. And, and, and I think by doing so, others will, other children uh, will be protected and be I kept hope safe. So. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Governor, let's talk now a little bit about the specific action items in the state of Texas because there's a lot that needs to be done uh, to get your bill across the line in Texas. It's uh, SB6. Yes, sir. It is the Texas Privacy Act. And let's talk about what people need to do to help get that into law in Texas. Well, right now, we'll have a hearing on it in, in uh, March, early March. Um, we have 15 co-sponsors already on the bill. Uh, I believe we'll have the votes to pass it out of the Senate. Uh, I never count anything until it's over, but I believe we'll have the votes to pass it out. Uh, I think if we had it on the floor today, we'd pass it out of the committee. Uh, we'll pass it over to the House, but there the Speaker of the House has been very clear uh, that this is an important, this is not an important issue, and he's been row and he's been rallying businesses to be, you know, you have to fight this. You know, I might not be able to stop it. He shouldn't want to stop it. Right. He, but but he's concerned about this false economic data. They're having, a, a, they're scheduled to have an NCAA Final Four tournament in San Antonio, and he says, "I'll do anything to keep that tournament." Well, that's a do anything kind of concerns me. Um, are we putting money above everything? Obviously, look, we're the 10th largest economy in the world. We have a $1.6 trillion economy. Uh, wow. No one's going to, going to ding us. Um, we want the NCAA to come. Sure. We want the NFL, sure. the NBA. We want all of that. And, and actually, in our bill, we allow them to set their own policy. They can set their own policy. They can do so, what they want. So I need in, the, in Texas, if you're watching from Texas, um, this is how we won in Houston. The white church, the black church, the brown church came together in a right. way, Tony, I've never I, seen. I remember that. And they organized, and the people stood up. They signed petitions. They got out there. They knocked on doors. And even though we were heavily outspent, um, we won that election, uh, 61 to 39 percent. So I need the churches to come together in Texas and uh, to uh, persuade the Speaker of the House to give us an up or down vote on the floor. Just give us an up or down vote. Mm -hmm. um, if we have an up or down vote, I'll, I'll, I'll live with the consequences of that. But I think when it comes to the floor with 94 Republicans, we need 60, 76 to pass it. I don't think there are going to be many Republicans who are going back for election in two years who are going to say, I voted for your kids to shower with the opposite sex in high school. And again, given the polling data that shows overwhelmingly Overwhelming. that the public supports this. Uh, also, let me just mention, if you are a pastor in the state of Texas on March the 7th, 7th. 
we are doing a pastor's briefing there in Austin, Texas. Uh, you will be there. Uh, we'll have other... Uh, Attorney State, General Ken Paxton. He'll be there. We're expecting the governor to join us as well. And, uh, and we'll have a number of folks there talking about these policy issues and more. To find out more, go to the website, uh, FRC. Uh, .org slash policy. Now, I also want to mention something that I think is, is very powerful that you have on a website. There's a link at the site that I just gave you uh, regarding people telling their stories to, yes. to actually going to your website to help in what we just heard with Kaylee. Others that will be willing to share their story. Tell us why you're doing that. Uh, well, we just want people to have a voice. Uh, I, I had a lady and she'll be, uh, hopefully, uh, Kaylee can come and testify for our committee. Um, uh, we had a lady that came to my office a few weeks ago, and you know these little plastic hangers on the back of a door that you right. hang your jacket on? Right. Well, she discovered, Tony, that that little plastic hanger had a camera in it for a long time. Some man had come in, they finally caught the person. They watched, once, they, once they found it, they watched out for this guy. You can buy it on Amazon for 12 bucks. Um, the point is, and this is a guy who had to sneak into the bathroom to place it and right. sneak in, you know, when they didn't think anyone was watching. Once these laws pass, these ordinance passes, then any man could walk in and there's not anything a police officer could say because their defense would be, well, I identify with the opposite sex and, and so there's nothing unless they commit a crime. Right. And um, so they would have access to the bathroom. And so this woman has said, enough. This is, this is an invasion of my privacy. Um, it's not right. I feel less safe. Um, so we're going to have a lot of these stories okay. and more stories from the Kayleys and, and, and by the way, the other the group we're looking for in Texas, we want Christian business leaders to step up. So far, the Texas Association of Business, which has been hijacked uh, by someone who supports this policy, uh, they have over 4,000 members. Their members have never seen the bill. Their members have never got a chance to vote on the bill. Mm -hmm. Their members, um, uh, the, the Texas Association of Business totally hijacked this issue. Uh, I think they become almost a pay for play where they take some other's issue and helps them raise right, money. Right. And so we're going to fight back against them. But I know most of the businesses in this group, they don't want this policy. Um, so uh, we want Christian business leaders to come out and join us as well. All right, uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, just to summarize, we're talking about SB6. SB6. What it simply does is it says state entities cannot adopt this gender-neutral bathroom policy forcing men and women to use the same facilities. Yes. It does not dictate what business can do. No. It does not dictate what entities that rent uh, public facilities, such as sporting yes. arenas, right. doesn't dictate what they can do. It simply says in the schools and on state property, we will not have this policy. Right. It's so simple. Yeah. Again, businesses can do whatever they want. Um, that's why you know the business association was hijacked because our bill protects them. It right. lets them do what they want. Doesn't who would force be against that? Right. Who would be against that? Would they like me to file a bill telling them what to do? No, we're not doing that. We're a free enterprise, Texas. And it tells the schools you cannot enforce any policy that boys and girls shower together or use the same locker rooms and bathrooms. Um, and then again, the public restrooms, like a rest stop, a library, right. a courthouse. Right. A place women where there's an anticipation of privacy. Yeah, and do you know how many times late at night Women are working or they're traveling or, and they're going in some right. government bathroom somewhere. What are they walking and see two guys in there? Yeah. Uh, we don't have enough police to police all those places. That's true. Um, so this is a public safety issue first and foremost. And um, uh, I'm all in. Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm not someone who falls on their sword, but I'm not someone who backs away from a fight. And I've said, look, if, if my election rested on this, I'll take, I'll, that's fine. Because this is the right thing to do. And right. there's always the right time to do the right thing. And like Dan Forrest, uh, we're going to do everything we can, and you're going to be, I know, a big help to us. Uh, we're going to do everything we can, get this out of the Senate, get it over to the House. And, um, you know, Governor Abbott has now weighed in uh, with the NFL, which I really appreciate it. And uh, we're just going to get the members to ask the Speaker for a vote. I don't actually think the Speaker would come out and say he's in favor of kids showering together in high school. I don't think he would. And I think if he allows it for a vote, um, it'll pass. Well, I hope the NFL and the other entities get the message of don't mess with Texas. Don't mess with Texas. And, uh, Governor, we'll see you there Thank in you, Texas. Tony. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Well, folks, again, I want to encourage you to go to the website, uh, frc.org slash privacy, where we've got a number of resources there for you. And please follow the links over to Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick's website, uh, where there is other information for you regarding the bill. Uh, also, as I mentioned, upcoming pastors conference, if you're in Texas, that's March the 7th in Austin. 
Uh, and if you have a story to tell, if you want to communicate, you can do that at the Lieutenant Governor's website. All right, to, to kind of wrap, our, uh, wrap up our time together here, uh, a couple more action items on the national level. It's not just on the state of Texas, not just now, uh, North Carolina, but again, as we talked about at the very beginning with Kathy. Kathy, welcome back. Thank you. Gonzalez, who is a director of our state and local efforts here at the Family Research Council. He works with uh, state policy councils across the country. Uh, there is a national component here. We uh, touched on it at the beginning about how uh, we see the Department of Education. It was their letter of Department of Justice, their letter that prompted this. Let's talk about now what has to be done here at the national level. Kathy, I'll start with you. Well, the Trump administration has done the right first step in um, pulling its objection in court to the education policy of Obama. So that was an important first step. Um, things happening at the local and state level all across the country are happening, but if you're wanting to focus on national, yeah, I want to get just a, a little bit, and then we can go into some of what's happening at some of the other sure. states. But in terms of, I mean, we could kind of nip this in the bud, as Barney Fife would say, mm -hmm. uh, if we saw the Department of Education rescinding that letter of guidance. Right. And actually, Tony, on our website, if people visit the website that you've given them, we have an action step that people can take to ask uh, government officials at all levels to take the correct action. And the correct a action at the federal level, as you said, involves rescinding some of the Obama era executive orders. And that, that, that hasn't happened about. yet. So right. I just want people to realize right. that right. don't just assume that uh, when, when there was a <clears throat> changing of the guard that everything was corrected. We still have some of these uh, misguided uh, policies in place which liberals at the local level are using as cover to advance these policies. Right. And then there's, there's the religious liberty aspect of all of this. Um, stories like Kaylee's really highlight the, the aspect of conscience right. and all of this. They're, they're not just victims in the bathrooms. They're victims in, when employers uh, and governments, uh, state governments and local governments, persecute employers, uh, employees who try to stand up to wrong government actions. And so there is federal and, frankly, state legislation, like the First Amendment Defense Act, that would protect people like that at all levels of government, um, as well as from uh, local businesses that would persecute people like Kaylee. Yeah, we, we didn't even really get into that right. component of the religious freedom component uh, of people being forced to go along with policies that are clearly counter to their moral convictions. Right, and, and that issue is cropping up in schools as well, as you might imagine. You have, um, you know, the public school system is filled with people of all races and religions and cultural sensitivities. And these policies hit some of those cultures even harder than others. And so what you see at the local level are people from all faith ba backgrounds, Muslim fathers getting up and castigating school boards for forcing them to take their kids out of school, you know, ethnic minorities who say, you know, we just, we, we really value our privacy in a way that perhaps you don't understand. Right. And we demand that that be respected. You know, that's part of, um, that's part of their right to privacy, frankly. So this is, you can even take it out of the realm of, um, you know, sex politics, but it's a basic right to privacy, as you've discussed today. And, and one aspect we have not touched on at all in terms of the uh, policies that these school boards are adopting as a result of the Department of Education is that it's not just showers, not just restrooms, but it's actually student travel. Overnight uh, stays. Overnight stays would require that they accommodate them to where you could have girls and boys staying in the same room. And parents are not allowed to be told. No one is allowed to be told that there's a biological male about to spend the night in a ho hotel room on a school trip with your daughter. And then when Seriously. you go into the college level, the same thing is happening in college dorms right. under the Department of Education's guidance. Now, right. Tony, some school districts um, preempted, evolved even before the Obama right. administration on this. So even retracting that terrible letter, there are, there are pockets, many out there, that are wanting to do this anyway. So even if we fight on the federal level, we have to keep fighting at the local and county level. Um, here in Fairfax County, which is right outside of Washington, one of the largest school districts in the country, they um, pulled the trigger on this two weeks before the Obama administration letter even came out. So we are fighting there, um, and you've got to get ahead of this. It's coming to a school district near you if it isn't there yet. So you have to get, you have to stay on it. In Fairfax, they caught us by surprise, and we have this terrible policy. But then in a neighboring county, Loudoun, another huge county in the nation in terms of a school system, we were able to get in front of it and stop it. Mm. So timing is everything. You know, everyone has to be vigilant and be aware it is coming to a school right. district near you. 
Kena, um, we've talked about North Carolina and we focused on Texas. Right. What other states are actively working on this right now? There are a handful of states that are seeking to address this through state legislation, Tony, and as you know, some governors are also taking action at, at the executive order level. Um, when you think about the kind of conscience protections that we described that really need to complement this work, uh, those, those efforts together are, are running in, in over a dozen states right now. And so state legislators right now are having to look at what's on the books, what's happening in their state, what's happening in local school districts, and are having to think very carefully about what they're going to do. We'd love to chat with them about their particular situation and connect them with the grassroots in their state. The, the good news on this is while you know this policy was uh, forced on states across the nation, we obviously saw a, a change of administrations in this election. We're ho hoping they do a thorough mop up and clean up from right. the last administration. But many state policymakers are not waiting. They're being proactive in addressing many of these issues. And so we see a record number of state legislatures, right. nearly half controlled by Republicans. Right. Uh, and they're actively working to address these issues of religious freedom, rights of conscience, and privacy. Yeah. That's right. And it's, it's, there's good news. This is not a partisan issue. These bills are bipartisan. They have bipartisan sponsors. This is common sense. Well, common sense sometimes escapes the political class. But we'll hope that uh, they do come to that understanding. Kena, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us. Nice to meet you. All right, folks, again, I want to thank you for joining us, but I want to again refer you to the website, frc.org slash policy, and there you can find all of these resources that are available to you. Uh, make use of them, uh, download, share them with friends, send uh, the links to others, but by all means, uh, get those to policymakers in your communities, in your schools, and in your state legislatures, and who knows? Maybe you need to run for office to make a difference as a parent in your community. For everyone here at the Family Research Council, I again want to thank you for joining us, and we look forward to talking to you again real soon.